our upcoming First Friday forums uh, in, uh, for our March First Friday forum, we will be sponsoring a business wellness forum. We've announced that previously and we're going to have four panelists from different businesses and they're going to talk about um, uh, wellness within various businesses in our area. They talk about how you might um, incorporate, promote um, wellness activities or efforts within your business and with the effort of trying to minimize health care costs and improve uh, morale and productivity and just being happier. Uh, April 5th, we, our first Friday forum in April will be our state legislators will come back and give us uh, sort of their quarterly um, update on what's happening in Madison. At that point, there will be uh, the budget will be in full, uh, full uh, discussion, so I think they'll have a lot to, to, to tell us. On May 3rd, we will have um, Todd Berry from the Wisconsin Taxpayers Alliance um, is going to kind of give him his, give us his perspective on the state from the Taxpayers Alliance. It's always an interesting program. He's um, uh, fairly straightforward and, and always has an interesting take on things. And in June, we're going to have, um, we're working on one or two options, one on energy or one on workforce development. We haven't nailed that one down, but it's going to be one of those two for our June uh, First Friday Forum. With that, I believe those are all the announcements, and anybody else have any announcements that I should be making, Betsy or John? Okay, then let's go right into our speaker, and we're very happy to have um, Cecilia Rattel with us today. Cecilia um, lives in Washington, D.C., but you all be happy to know that she's a badger at heart. She grew up in, uh, in Madison. She did take a little detour to Minnesota for a while. Um, she grew up in Madison, and she currently is Senior Director of Policy for the U.S. Chamber and the Institute for a Competitive Workforce, which is a 501c3 um, really form that works in conjunction with the U.S. Chamber. And she leads pre-K to 12 policies that focus on closing the achievement gap between advantaged and disadvantaged students through improvements in accountability, um, various curricula like science, technology, engineering, and math, uh, works on teacher quality and student achievement. She also manages the work of aligning the business community on education policy and advances policy positions to ensure that uh, businesses remain competitive in a global economy. That's the overall arching goal of her position. Previously, uh, Cecilia was a lobbyist for the Minnesota Chamber of Commerce, where she concentrated on education, immigration, labor management, and health issues. And she, in that position, she led reforms for the chamber um, in education. In, in education, and she was uh, at that point was a part of a team that was recognized as the 2011 Business Leader in Public Policy by uh, Report Politics in Minnesota. So, um, with that brief introduction, Cecilia is going to talk about um, her perspective on education from the U.S. Chamber. She has a slide presentation or a PowerPoint, I should say, the slide's a little old. Um, <laughs> and uh, she has a PowerPoint presentation that will go for about a half hour, and then afterwards she'll take uh, questions and answers. So without any further introduction, uh, I'd like to introduce to you Cecilia Rattel. Thank you all very much. Um, you all have the packets of the, the presentation we're going to do, so if you can't see, see those. Otherwise, everything will be up on the screen. Um, first off, thank you all so much for coming today. It's so nice to be back in Wisconsin, even though when I woke up this morning, it said feels like negative 19. Um, it's been a while since that happened, so it's always good to know I'm alive and still kicking. So, um, and a special thank you to John Rogers. There you are back there for having me um, and in making sure this all came together so nicely. So without further ado, um, let's get started. So as you just heard, um, I do work on the U.S. Chamber of Commerce's policies um, in K-12, but I also work at the Institute for Competitive Workforce, which is a 501c3 affiliate of the Chamber. And that is where all the education and workforce development is housed at the Chamber. Um, we really truly focus on promoting high educational standards to ensure that we have a quality workforce. Um, 
So as President Obama, you know, regularly says about education, it's not only an issue of economics, it's probably the economic issue of our time. And just last week we had Senator Rubio at an event at, the, at our chamber building in D.C. And he had, his whole speech was based on protecting the middle class. And if you're truly going to protect the middle class, you have to ensure that you have an educated workforce. Otherwise, the students that have traditionally not been educated are going to continue to not be educated, and the rest of the population will continue to be um, further dividing the um, classes. So um, when you look overall kind of the national crisis about what's happening, one of the probably most troubling statistics is that for the first time in our history, kids in America are less likely to graduate from high school than their parents. Um, I mean, to talk about truly not being you know, part of the American dream, that kind of sums it up. Traditionally, we have always been the next generation, achieved more, achieved higher, um, and that's to a point where it's not happening anymore. Um, secondly, a third of American students don't com complete high school, and another third of high school students, when they do enter college, need a remediation. Um, so we know there's something not working, and we, it will take us all to fix that. Um, finally, by 2020, there's going to be 123 million American jobs that will be high skill and high wage, but only about 50 million Americans to fill them. You know, we don't have to have a math expert out there to tell you. That's a huge skills gap, and it's a huge issue for businesses and really our tax system as a whole. So when you compare the U.S. internationally, um, a lot of these things you've started to see, this is much more kind of commonly understood and commonly recognized. When, um, but even when we look at the different states, in you know, Minnesota, Wisconsin, Iowa, traditionally we always thought that this air, like, region was way up in the top. Well, back when um, you know, No Child Left Behind started, we started collecting very specific data. It became very clear that Wisconsin was kind of middle of the pack. Yes, it, we were achieving above the national average, but there's still about two-thirds of students in eighth grade that are not reading at grade level. And that's obviously a huge issue. Similarly, in math, um, you're higher up for you know, being compared among other states. However, it's still about two-thirds of the kids are graduating from eighth grade uh, or finishing eighth grade without being proficient in math. So you take that internationally, and it gets even scarier. So scarier. The PISA test is an internationally benchmarked test that you know, allows countries to compare themselves to each other. And you know, for reading, the US was ranked 12th. And when you look at so the colors in the middle, so there's the dark blue, the white, and then the light blue, the colors in white are not statistically significantly different. So that's kind of all the same group. So yes, we were 12th. But there are some other ones in there. But when you look at which countries are in there, um, I think that's the part that's troubling. Um, same thing. The U.S. has dropped down to 17th now in science. And, oops, sorry. I'll start going on. 25th in math. And one of the things that you will often hear, you know, people say, well, we should all be looking at Massachusetts for all the answers. They're always achieving the highest. They're doing so many great things. And they are doing a lot of great things. However, Secretary Duncan, who is the current U.S. Secretary of Education, will even say, if Massachusetts was its own country and compared internationally, they would still rank 17th overall. So yes, they are doing better than a lot of other states. However, they are still not, you know, they don't have all the answers. Now, one thing that the U.S. is very good at is spending a lot of money. We spend <laughs> the second um, most money right behind Luxembourg. Um, and you can see the white bar there is the average. So it's not always the money, but it's how we're spending that money. And that's something that you know, we all could probably do better. Um, as I talked about, um, a lot of this data was able to start being collected in 2001 when No Child Left Behind was included in the um, ESEA Act, which is Elementary and Secondary Education Act. And one of the things that was put into place in that law, and nobody will stand here and tell you that that law was perfect and that it shouldn't be changed. Everybody is in agreement that it needs to be updated. Congress needs to update it if they want changes to be made. However, last spring, um, we saw that Congress was not going to be updating it. 
the administration started saying, okay, well, all of the kind of punishments that would happen if No Child Left Behind stayed in place are going to kick in next year because the, one of the biggest requirements of it was by 2014, all students would be proficient. So basically, the students that were going into kindergarten the year that the bill was passed were supposed to be proficient in math and reading by the time they graduated 12th grade. Well, those kids are now about to graduate 12th grade, and clearly enough changes haven't been made. So what the Department of Education did was opened up to states the ability to change their accountability system through that system and give them waivers so that they were not, no longer being held accountable for that requirement. So what happened is, so the biggest thing about No Child Left Behind was you could finally compare Wisconsin to New Jersey and New Jersey to Arizona and every state across the country. Well, doing 35 waivers Sets, it takes a huge step backwards because now what we have in place is we have the 15 states that still have the old accountability system, but now you've got 35 states that have completely different accountability systems. And as you can see, Wisconsin is one of those states that is, does have a new accountability system, which also had a few other changes to it as well. So some of the major changes in Wisconsin's waiver um, if you go to, so it creates this new accountability index, so you have achievement, um, growth, gap closing, all those different things, but one of the, if you go down to the fourth bullet point, it eliminates supplemental educational services. Um, this is a huge issue for anybody that supports school choice and making sure that kids that have, you know, are way behind are getting those extra tutoring hours. Once again, we will not say that you know, all those, they're called SES dollars, were being used in the most effective way because all the tutoring systems or, you know, providers were not, you know, good players. They were not all providing the best tutoring. However, completely cutting that off um, is also very problematic. The other really big one for Wisconsin, Wisconsin is the only state that, um, that I know of that did this, and it's the second to bottom um, bullet point here. And so in the past, it was a yearly... Um, you know, identification of your priority and focus schools. And some states have gone to doing it every two years with their waivers. There's, I think, two other states that do it every three years. Um, Wisconsin is now doing it every four years. So your student, if you're going through the system, could only get counted three times in a 12-year period, which is a very scary thought if those schools are not making significant improvements and if they are schools that have traditionally you know, not been where they need to be. So those are a few things that everyone needs to be paying attention to um, in Wisconsin, but also really throughout the country. And as you watch Congress maybe reauthorize, you know, No Child Left Behind is part of ESEA, so what they would reauthorize would be ESEA. Um, if they reauthorize it, these waivers only last, I think it's two years. Um, so the system could all go back to whatever ESEA wants, and the money that you're now putting into your, like to create the systems for the waiver, could be completely negated, even if the um, law becomes, you know, changes in the next six months. So there's a lot of questions around, you know, was, like, can the administration, like, do they have the power to make those significant changes to a law that went through Congress? And it's a huge question, you know, does the administrative branch, I mean, we all did eighth grade social studies, can the administrative branch kind of knock out the uh, balances of power and say, we are going to undercut one of the biggest parts of this law? Um, another big part of No Child Left Behind's law was that it required that states develop a assessment and basic skills. So both math and reading, every state has their own tests. We also all, everyone knows the NAEP test, um, and NAEP, N-A-E-P, is this test that um, is, you know, supposed to be international or nationally benchmarked and has traditionally been what we compare and use for No Child Left Behind ratings. But what you saw was when states created their own assessments and created their own um, tests for these things, where the rigor was varied significantly. So if you look at this next graph, 
The darker green, I wish I would have chose different colors for this because once I saw it, it wasn't as dark as I was hoping. The darker green, so the left side of the two separate ones, are where Wisconsin State tests tell kids that they're proficient. So Wisconsin State tests tell 81% of fourth graders and 61% of eighth graders that they're proficient on math. However, on the NAEP test, which is taken across the country, it's 45% of fourth graders and 39% of eighth graders. Okay, and it's, I mean, it's like that for other subjects and other um, states as well. Like Wisconsin is not unique in this sense at all. In reading, the gap is significantly more. So it's 82 and 85% for fourth and eighth graders and then 33 and 34%. So if you look at a couple of sample questions, I love a sample question because then you can kind of be like, what does it mean to be, you know, proficient in fourth grade? So on NAEP, um, this is one that they had. So which of these could be measured using a meter stick? Length of a swimming pool, temperature, weight, or number of people? Um, so hopefully you all know the answer to that. <laughs> um, same thing. Here's another math question. You know, if Joe's recipe takes to bake a cake 25 to 28 minutes, about how long is this? So a quarter of an hour, half hour, hour, hour and a half. Okay, so um, these are a couple NAEP fourth grade questions. Now moving into eighth grade math. Now this is one, if every person in this room can't get it right, I'm not sure what we're going to do. Okay, so it says according to the graph below, I just put it over to the side to make a little more space, which element forms the second greatest portion of the Earth's crust? So they give you the graph, they give you all the labels, so this is not a knowledge-based question. It's can you read a graph? And that would be a basic um, answer or a basic level of proficiency for eighth graders. And now this is advanced. So you've got three points. Which point would give like finish out a rectangle? Again, you've got, you know, a little bit of knowledge will take you a long way. So we clearly saw that the proficiency levels between what states were doing and what the national kind of standard was was significantly different. But then when you looked between states, it was also significantly different. So here's a fourth grade question on Wisconsin's test, and this would be a proficiency level cut score test for a fourth grader. It says, which sentence tells a fact, not an opinion? So cats are better than dogs, cats climb trees better than dogs, cats are prettier than dogs, cats have nicer fur than dogs. Okay, so same grade, different state. Massachusetts. I'm going to save us all an hour and not read that. But you can see the difference. That's a proficiency level fourth grade question. So when you're comparing states even, it's not equivalent. So we go back to, okay, now it's, you know, been 11 years since No Child Left Behind passed with all of its, you know, flaws. Some of the good things that we saw were states have different standards, states use different assessments, um, we have some similar data, but when you compare what states try to do on their own, states have an interest in making sure people think that their students are the smartest. I think we would all accept that. So, a couple of years ago now, a bipartisan initiative um, of state leaders, so the Council on State School Chief Officers and the National Governors Association got together and developed a set of standards um, for language arts and math. And Really what their goal was, was to gap, to close this gap between the expectations between high schools and what they needed once they left K-12 and entered either college or career. So what they did was they went to higher ed institutions, they went to the business community throughout the country, and they said, okay, when you get a student that has gone through a K-12 program, what are your expectations of what you need them to be able to do? And then they back mapped from there. Okay, so if you're graduating and this is what you need to be college and career ready, in 12th grade you better be able to do this, in 11th grade, 10th grade, 9th grade, and that's how they created these, college, these common core standards. So obviously probably the most important thing that was created was this level of consistency. So for the first time now, you know, ever, the United States has 45 states that have the same set of standards. Equity. Minnesota, Wisconsin, Iowa, there's a lot of movement of the people that live in those states, but now for the first time you can make sure that regardless of which zip code you're in, you're getting the same excellent education. 
opportunities, so students need them the knowledge and the skills to give those, them the opportunities in either college or career. Um, clarity, instead of having the state standards that were literally a mile wide and an inch deep, these go very, very deep and really get into the understanding of multiple different ways to approach different problems. And finally, the economies of scale. So common standards create a foundation for districts and states to work collaboratively and finally allow, if one teacher or one district or one school is creating an excellent set of you know, mathematicians, people can finally go to them and say, okay, what are you guys doing so well? And then you can scale it up. So as you can see, like I said, there's 45 states in DC that have adopted both the math and language arts standards. Minnesota, um, two years ago, only adopted the language arts standards. However, they are functioning now and acting like as though they have also adopted the math. So I would expect them to formally adopt the math standards um, in the short term. Um, the other four states, um, you know, I'm going to actually Nebraska next week, and one of the things that they want me to talk about is how do we get to, like, how can we adopt the Common Core standards? Because everybody else is talking about them and we're not doing anything. So that'll be a great um, thing to see happen. Um, one of the best things about the Common Core standards is you're finally able to link the standards, so what you're telling the teachers, the parents, the kids that they need to know, to what they're actually being tested on. And that has not happened in the past. Instead of having this kind of cut system where you've got these assessments and then there's this, you know, the teaching manuals and those sorts of things, they finally all come together. Granted, the implementation, and Carrie and I were talking about this late last night, um, the implementation of this is going to be key to its success. Right? You have to make sure, if you've got a teacher that's been in a classroom for 15 years, teaching math a certain way or teaching language arts a certain way, and now you're changing what the standards are for them, you need to make sure you give them the professional development that they need in order to implement the standards and get those kids that they're having in their classrooms ready for the next step. Because once you miss them on one level, it just kind of keeps growing. So other things that the business community should and really um, should pay attention to with these is know your state timeline and plan. Um, Wisconsin adopted these back in 2010, in June of 2010, so it should be fairly laid out um, on the DPI website. Um, prepare for the anticipated drop in test scores. So in Kentucky, um, the state chamber there actually went around with the state school chief officer and started talking to groups just like this and saying, okay, so you know the difference between what you've always had on NAEP and your Wisconsin test or NAEP and the Tennessee test. When the Common Core standards come out, your test scores of the kids that are proficient are going to be a lot more similar to those on the NAEP test than those of the Wisconsin test. And you have to set that bar high because if you don't set it high, you just lower it, people will meet the expectation of where it's set. If you set it high, eventually they'll get there. So you got to embrace the kind of painful few years that it'll take to get over that hump. But that's a huge um, kind of hurdle that we all know is coming, and we just have to be ready for it. Um, so, you know, talk to your local superintendents, engage in public dialogue. No, I mean, this morning when I was at the Sheboygan Chamber of Commerce and there was a um, few school districts represented, the partnerships, right? So if a science teacher, because the science standards are now being created this spring, or a math teacher needs, you know, actual professional development to do something and learn how to do a standard, being a business that maybe provides those skills to your employees and, like, it's second nature to you, invite them in and figure out a way to partner with them. Um, there's also some resources online, both, like I said, Kentucky has a great uh, resource, and Pennsylvania, um, the Parent Teacher's Guide, um, that's also a great one because parents have a huge role in a lot of this um, because they finally will know exactly where their student stands. Um, and one of the major things that these standards are trying to address, of course, is the skills gap. Um, so I touched on this in the beginning, um, but the skills gap is something that is real, you know, throughout the country. Um, and in this region, with a manufacturing focus, um, I know you guys are feeling it just as much as the rest of the country. So, you know, despite the recession and high unemployment rates, there's still an estimated 3 million jobs that go unfilled. And that's a lot of empty jobs. And when you ask the, you know, people in HR, why are these jobs not filled? And they'll say, we've not had a single applicant that is qualified. And that is a scary thought, um, but we have to figure out a way to close that. And when you put, uh, a group recently pulled employers and a half of them reported that they were unable to recruit workers 
also for those open positions. So even if they said, come do this, you know, people were saying, no, I don't want that kind of job, or I don't want to do that. So, um, when you, and when you look at how long it's been since we've been talking about this upcoming skills gap, in 1991, there was a U.S. Department of Labor um, the achieving necessary skills, and they started saying, business leaders, you got to pay attention to this. And 30 years ago, President Reagan released a report called Nation at Risk, and they also said, in that report, it was more focused on education, saying, our biggest issue is our education system. And just this past summer, the Council on Foreign Relations released a report that our biggest national security threat is our education system. So it's real. It's coming in all directions. Um, but one of the things that I know you guys in this community have been working a lot on and um, you know, are trying to figure out the best way to do it um, without exhausting all of your resources is strengthening of CTE, so career and technical education. And one of the things that you know, a lot of businesses are always looking for is how do you teach leadership? It's a hard skill to teach. You can't really sit in the classroom and say this is what you should be doing. Um, but getting students out into actual settings in businesses, they're able to build those relationships and figure out how to become a leader. Also, those exposures to effective leaders teaches them, okay, so now that's how you mentor, that's how you assist other people in learning things. And eventually what you hope to have is those kids that have you know, maybe started the program in seventh or eighth grade, now they're 11th or 12th graders and they're back mentoring those 7th or 8th graders. So it really becomes a cyclical system, so they're also feeling that, you know, learning of how to be an effective leader. Finally, when you're, you know, empowering students to learn, they suddenly become a lot more kind of self-aware and a lot of times they want to achieve, they want to be, you know, a business leader, they want to figure out how to do it, and when they have those experiences and are actually in businesses, they learn how to adjust their, um, you know, high school days. Um, so some of the things that, you know, I know, like I said, you guys are doing a lot of things in this area, but if you are not currently participating in one of your guys' local CTE programs, a few of the things that you should all be working on is establishing those relationships. And I know, like I said this morning with the ch uh, Chamber of Commerce here, they're working on the, um, a business education partnership program. Um, ensure that you know, there's explicit roles and expectations for everyone involved. So it's not just give us money or give our kids internships, but it's when our kids come to intern with you, make sure they are learning how to be an accountant in X. You know, having those very explicit roles between both sides allows for, you know, saying yes, this was successful or this wasn't. You also don't, you want to make sure what you don't have is, you know, one side saying, okay, we're going to give you 15 of our kids for you know, half a day for a semester, and that not being good use of their time. You don't want them sitting there you know, not doing anything or showing up late, coming in early, and saying, well, you still have to give them you know, a passing grade because they're seniors and they're going to graduate and they need that test score, or they need that grade on their um, transcript. So it's making sure that it's really worth both of your guys' time because it does take a lot of um, effort on both sides, so that data and inf information sharing. Um, finally, there's a ton of you know, technical skills advisory commissions, so make sure that you're just paying attention to those, using their resources, a lot of them are free. Um, so tap into those, you know, the internships, part-time jobs, mentoring. Um, I also, we talked about this some last night as well, um, giving teachers internships and opportunities over the summer is also a great way to hit more kids. If you might only be able to, you know, afford or have time for two students um, during the school year, but you can give a 10-week internship to a local teacher, and then he or she goes back and is with, you know, 30, 60, 90 kids a, a, every day, um, you've suddenly exponentially increased how you're sharing you, what's happening in your business, and that is a great opportunity for you to really enrich what they know and what they're already learning and what you need. Um, and like I said in the, pro the slide, promote your opportunities because, you know, Teachers do not have time to be looking on every business in the area's website to see what they have available. So if you need something, you know, I'm sure John or other people at the chamber can help you, um, you know, talk with your districts and you can get that done. There's also, as you guys are leaving, um, we recently released, it's called the Education Reform Playbook. So it is intended for business leaders trying to get involved in education. Um, and trying to figure out how to bridge those partnerships. I would highly recommend grabbing one of those. There is also a couple other things. Um, the school board candidate questionnaire 
um, school boards have so much power that they oftentimes um, they go unnoticed and people just think, oh, those meetings are boring. Um, I'm not going to go. But there are certain people that always go, and those are the ones that have been making all the decisions. So I highly recommend getting involved. This school board questionnaire is intended for if you are a company or a group or a um, you know, person that endorses school board candidates. These are some business-friendly questions to figure out if they are people that are worthy of your endorsement. Um, there's also chambers throughout the country, including Billings, who's just launching this um, as of last week, a school board candidate um, training program. So training business leaders how to become effective school board candidates and school board leaders, um, another great resource. Um, finally, um, this is our third series of Leaders and Laggards. Um, our first two were focused on K-12. This is a state-by-state -state report card of public post-secondary education um, institutions. Um, so if there's also those on the way out. If there is anything that I've talked about today, I mean, we're going to go into question and answer here, but that you want more um, information on or you want you know, a digital copy of any of these, um, all of my contact information is in the packets and up on the slide. I am happy to help and answer any questions that you may have. So thanks again. Yes, ma'am. These criteria have never been weighted. I know Finland and Estonia, for example, are pretty homo homogeneous in culture and very, very high. Um, but is there any uh, standard for weighting it according to the Finland population and things like that? Okay, so the question was is there any um, weighting of the standards when the assessments happen for different populations? Um, simple answer is no. So um, we you know, firmly believe that all students should be able to achieve the same level. And if you look at schools that have been successful and students that have been able to be successful throughout the country, there really is not one factor that says, oh, if you're this, then you can't learn. Um, obviously, there are factors that make it harder and you know, do those sorts of things and have other impacts on it. But I mean, we strongly believe that all students need to have the same standards and have the same kind of accountability to where they need to be. Yes, sir? So then uh, evaluating us internationally really doesn't work very well because here in the United States, we are required to educate every student, whereas in other countries, they, they kind of layer it. And so is it possible that saying we're falling so far behind is because of who's being measured? OK, so the question is? My, my, my question is about um, Say in, in Germany, okay. You know, by, by ninth grade, it's determined at the level of education that child is going to have. Mm -hmm. And so, are they just measuring the you know top third that are going on to college? Whereas here in the, in the United States, you know, we're measuring every child. You know. In so the question the is, thing. should we be met, should we be internationally compared because we educate everybody, whereas other countries, yeah. you don't believe educate everybody regardless of their background. Well, that skews the, the numbers. Skews the numbers. Um, so obviously there's some countries that have significantly, you know, more various populations. Um, mm -hmm. Germany is a great example of a country that has a very good workforce development system. So yeah, they do start in high school determining what track those kids are going to go on. Um, but as far as fourth and eighth graders go, most countries all make sure that their kids are reading at grade level by the time they hit fourth grade. So things like that, there are really no excuses for. Um, and if that's, I mean, if that's our country and this is what we are, then we have to figure out a way to educate everyone. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, no, I know. Three. Mm -hmm. And Wisconsin's kind of average. Massachusetts very high, Maryland, New Hampshire. You know, those are very first of all, they're very small states. You can probably get all of them in the state of Wisconsin. <laughs> but um, taking into consideration poverty or um, No, so I can answer your question. I know your so the question is, are there other factors included when you're comparing states amongst each other? Um, no. This is a 
purely academic achievement level of proficiency. Um, or something I was going to add, I'm forgetting what it was, but um, I'm sorry. Oh no, I mean, this is just academic achievement, but one of the things, this is what I was going to say, is that when you look at growth of who, what states have done the most growth, I did not put this slide on my slideshow because I didn't want to make anyone sad, Wisconsin, Iowa, Minnesota are literally at the bottom. So in the last 10 years, the amount of growth that the state has seen in all of these assessments has barely changed. Whereas you've got some states, um, like a Florida, for example, that have a huge population of um, Hispanic students that are just continuing to grow. They finally said, okay, what do we need to do? How can we change what we're like, providing for our students? What reading program? I mean, there was a huge push in their reading programs. They no longer promote kids from third to fourth grade that are not reading at grade level. And um, they, their growth was exponential in the last 10 years. So I mean, there's definitely states that have really figured out a way to change what they're doing. Granted, for states like Iowa, Minnesota, Wisconsin, we started out kind of at the front of the pack. And they just haven't changed much compared to what we did 10 years ago. Yeah? So are um, things like class size and technology used in classrooms, are those things, I, mean, I guess you're going to say no, that that's not measured in the CETA, but we know that somehow comes into play, especially class size, on how students are going to learn and that's a of an impact. So the question is, is any, well, let's say is anything else included in these numbers? No. The only thing in these numbers is academic achievement. Um, I guess I would disagree about class size. I know there are some studies that, you know, especially for the younger grades that have shown class size matters a lot. Um, but when you look at countries that have, you know, um, some of the Asian countries especially, they've got classrooms of 80 kids with one teacher, but it's the discipline that is different. And when you start looking at the cost that we spend, that's where we get into the most cost, is usually you know, the adults, whether it's teachers, administrators, wherever it is. Yes? Just a note to that, in Europe, and France, and the Western European countries, also Germany, they're anywhere between 30 and 40 people that students in class. And why do you <coughs> I would have a question. Uh, have you guys done any analysis on the distribution of the success or and or lack thereof? So, for example, is this a predominantly inner city problem or is this a broad based problem across all school districts? That's a great question. So, I talk to a lot of um, local chambers throughout the country and you guys have been very good. No one has actually said this here, and this is a first, literally a first. Usually, what you will hear is our school district, our school, our neighborhood, we're not the problem, it's them. And that's not the case. It's really, truly not the case. When you start looking at actual numbers in a lot of schools, you have got kids that are in you know, predominantly you know, white schools that are upper middle class, and you still have usually about a third of them, at least, that are not reading at grade level. And when you have that many kids throughout the country, I and mean, if you've got two thirds of kids throughout the country that are not reading at grade level, it's got to be more than just those kids. So, in the back. The, uh, the two slides that really bothered me the most in this were the fourth grade uh, question about cats versus dogs, and then the fourth grade question in Massachusetts that goes through a paragraph about Leo Tolstoy. Uh, I, uh, I have to wonder how, uh, I mean, are, is there any, is, has there been any research about how much more educated the fourth grade teachers in Massachusetts might be compared to Wisconsin? Because, I mean, the dogs versus cats, it's like a step above finger painting, and Tolstoy is like, 
upper high school collegiate reading? I mean, is yeah, there I, mean, I think there's different, um, obviously, requirements in every state for teachers. But the thing that's really key is it's, it's not the teachers that are making these tests up. It's not the teachers that were, you know, that are saying this is what we should be tested on. It's the rest of the state saying this is okay. We're going to go with this. So I think to just look at the teachers and say, well, is there something that they're doing different, if they're doing better? If you told the fourth grader teachers in or Wisconsin that they needed to do you know, the Massachusetts question, then they would change their curriculum, they'd change what they were doing. They might already be doing that, but when you don't have questions that align to that and you're saying, it's okay if it's this low, because we need to make sure that it was 81% of our kids are you know, going to be called proficient on their state test because we don't want to tell them otherwise and their parents otherwise, it's not the teacher's fault, you know. It's is it, is it like a school board level, is it, is it state level? It's state level. It's all state level, but so it's you know wherever. So it's probably DPI. Carrie, correct me if I'm wrong. So it's the state that's setting these standards that it have approved this um, you know test, and we're like they're just implementing it. There's nothing. I mean, it's kind of out of their hands. Whereas with the Common Core standard, Wisconsin, all teachers in Wisconsin, New Jersey, Massachusetts, te not Texas because they didn't adopt them, but um, they will all be able to, you know, achieve the same levels. It's also a lot clearer. So if you've got a teacher that maybe is moving here from Nevada, they'll know what their expectations are, and it won't be changing every couple of years. Do you have a question? We also, when you look at Finland's educational system, when you see the input that the teachers have in creating the standards and everything that goes on in the Finland system, and then we look at the Common Core standards, which I do, I, I do agree with the fact that we have the high standards across the board, but they were created by the Council of Chief State School Officers and the Governors Association. What type of input did the educators have and teachers, how much were they able to to work with this too, so that they themselves can have the professional development that they need, such as countries like Finland. Okay, so good question. So the implement or the development of the Common Core standards and the assessment consortiums that are still meeting. So there's two assessment basically groups that are creating. Um, these assessments right now. They both have had teachers or teacher leadership in them during their development, but they weren't led by teachers. Um, I think one of the biggest differences between what happens in Finland and the way that those teachers are respected and kind of put on a pedestal versus here all comes back down to the level of professionalism that you know, teacher unions have. So in Finland, yes, there are very strong teacher unions, but they're a professional organization. They're much more like a bar association for lawyers, whereas here, they're a labor union. They're talking about hours a day, number of days, and it's night and day difference. When that's what you're arguing about, you're not going to be considered a professional organization or a profession, or professional, or pro professional. That's the right word. So that's another huge difference between what happens in Finland and here. parents who don't value education, so they are totally fine with their kids staying home, you know, because what's the point? Uh, maybe they don't work, they didn't have an education, so the kids apparently need mentors, you know, something like that. I don't know how much of that is a factor in it. Um, you know, getting junior achievement into the school, so, you know, other people are showing the kids why they should learn. But also, even as you said, so many parents from maybe middle class families who say, oh, I don't want my child to work while they're in high school, not understanding or appreciating that maybe getting a job when you're in high school is the best motivation to learn, you know, why you were in school. Uh, so many of the kids don't seem motivated or understand or appreciate why they need to learn these things. They think they're going to just graduate or something. <laughs> yeah, no, you're exactly right. And there's a huge connection, actually, between um, the reading levels in third grade. If you're if you, there is a report that the Annie C. Casey Foundation came out with a couple of years ago, and this has kind of been a well-respected um, stat, that if you don't 
um, leave third grade reading at grade level, you are 10 times less likely to graduate from high school. So between you know preschool or kindergarten and third grade, you are learning how to read. After third grade, you read to learn. So if you don't know how to read when you leave third grade, suddenly you can't read your you know problems in math. You can't do a science lab. You can't do social studies. I mean, and it's just exponential how far you get behind, and you get to a point where you're like, okay, well this is a waste of time. Or if you graduate and you go to college, another third of the kids are then getting remediated and paying for which what tax dollars should have already paid for. Um, so there's also been a huge kind of upsurge in um, bills that are starting to be floated at state levels that if a student was, went through the K-12 system in that state and then attends a state school and has to take any remedial courses, they are then able to um, charge the district back. Which, in my opinion, would change a lot of people's perspective about you know where we need to be, and um, we did run that bill when I was in Minnesota. I would just like to say, still a fan. <laughs> If you're in fifth grade and you, you haven't had that, that level, whatever it is, 
you will repeat fifth grade in every class. <clears throat> so all your all your peers move on, mm -hmm. and you're still in fifth grade, and all the others are moving up. You only do that once, as a student, and then you know that you need to pick it up. And, right. and I think that has a lot to do. I think that will easily solve that problem. Yeah, there's no doubt that social promotion is a huge issue in the U.S. Who have I not gotten? Anyone that I've not yet hit? Uh, touched on this a little bit. The, the, uh, moving away from the international scene uh, for a second, like, let's look at ourselves for, for, for a minute. And then the slide that I thought was the, uh, the, the what was, was most striking for me was the, the, the estimated 3 million jobs remain unfilled in 2012. I think that a lot of our, my generation, the, the younger generation these days, we can be very skilled and get the training that we need at, a, at good schools all over the country. But I think a lot of it is the, the, the culture of uh, wanting Saturdays off and to be off at noon on Fridays. Uh, so I think that because things do come easier than they did for the baby boomers in the room, uh, I think that we, I think a lot, a lot of these values should be coming from home as well as from teachers in the classroom. Uh, but I think a lot of it is work ethic. <laughs> Something that is uh, that in Wisconsin I always valued uh, because I think this this state has one of the strongest work ethics uh, in the country, especially in the manufacturing sector, which is hurting the most with this skills gap issue. Uh, so I, I always scratch my head and wonder how can we close the skills gap because we have the skilled individuals to fill these jobs, we have the jobs available, uh, but when they when they show up and when they get hired, they show up late or they don't show up at all. And, then and it's I think easier. that's one of the things that the business education partnerships that they're right. starting to work on more and more and a lot of the career tech education pieces and getting more students and teachers into those businesses um, is really the key. I mean, there's no doubt about the fact that the business world and the education world speak two different languages. And until you can bridge that language gap, um, it's going to almost continue to be a skills gap. In the back. Uh, I live in Massachusetts. And one of the things that uh, I belong to an HR organization there and the city here, how many of you have heard of city here? They have a, an office in, it's a business and education uh, partnership of some sort where they get mentors from businesses to work in schools. And city here was just all over those businesses working with HR and everything for partner with businesses to help the schools. And I know they have one in here in Milwaukee, and I'm not certain how strong it is. Can you address that? Um, so City Year is similar to um, like the Reading Corps um, type of program. So it's in select cities, and it's a great program. Um, but it's not something, it's a, I think it's federally funded, um, at least with some sort of joint grants with businesses. I don't know the details of how they're funded, but it is a wonderful <laughs> program that new um, college graduates enter into. Yeah, there are several students Several parents I've talked to whose children have gone to different city year programs and are now going to be trained so that they can be mentors within his businesses, now to businesses with the schools. Great. So, and there was, there was Still nothing like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Okay. Well, the run one year. I wanted to know if the uh, yeah. um, private, you know, like I just received a solicitation from our Archbishop Stolen because they have 98% graduation rate, graduation rate uh, to go on to college from the, the Catholic school system in New York City. Mm -hmm. My question is, are, are, are parochial schools included in this, in staff, in this staff? No, so these are purely public schools. I will say, um, regardless of their public, private, any sort of graduation rates, we have to make sure that we're not just giving out diplomas, make sure that there's a lot of rigor behind those diplomas that are given out. Um, and really what you should be asking, if people are saying we have a 98% graduation rate, oh, is how many 98% went to college. But how many of those kids then had to take remedial courses? That's the question. Okay, right here. Just a statement, I wanna say thank you for sharing this information. I think made things clear, it's education and business need to work together because we're in this together. Yeah. The bottom line is we as a country, as a state, we're here for you. Perfect ending. Thank you. Um, we'd love to, and please let me know how can be helpful. Well, great. Thanks, Basilia, for coming. And
I, I think you're, she doesn't have to leave right away, so if any of you have questions, you're free to ask her questions and talk with her a little while longer. She's going to go and visit her parents in Madison, so it's great. Um, first of all, I, I want to say um, you may have noticed that our sponsor again this year is Prevea. We want to thank them again for sponsoring uh, the 2013 First Friday Forums. Um, if any of you have an interest in some of the topics we've talked about, there are two committees at the chamber could very much use your help. One is the Business Advocacy Committee, which uh, puts together the First Friday Forums. Um, and the other is the Business Education Partnership. Um, that's part of the Workforce Development Committee, which is working on some of these efforts to um, bring business and education together so that we can, ha we can um, uh, close that skills gap. Um, if, you, if you're interested in any of those committees, talk to Betsy or John at the chamber or me. And one, one last announcement, it's not our group, but it's an ancillary group on February 6th, I think it is Melissa, right? February 6th is the Sheboygan County Economic Development, 5th, 5th. February 5th is the Sheboygan County Economic Development Corporation annual meeting. If you're interested, contact them for that. So with that, um, have a great, um, have a great weekend and uh, stay warm. Thank you.